Hello and welcome to Silver Threads. Today's creepypasta stories will thrill and chill you to your bones. We start with a tale about the creatures who wander your house at night, disturbing sounds on chalkboards, a self-cleaning bedroom, and a child trapped in the air vents. Now, let me tell you a story. Some Pals Chilling in Your House at Night A Bedtime Story for Adults Written by Glass When you shut your eyes, does the world around you still exist? The only correct answer to this question is, obviously. What should concern you is whether or not it exists in the way you've been perceiving it. Not everyone is as outgoing as you are. Some creatures are very shy indeed. They want to get to know you and help you out. But they aren't so certain you'd be receptive to their whole deal. So they wait until the darkness falls and your breathing becomes soft and regular before they emerge. I'm going to introduce you to three of them now. It's natural to be nervous meeting new people. But these three already think you're just swell. So don't stress out about it. The first one you may already be a little familiar with. They are certainly the most outgoing of the three. If you've ever tossed and turned on your pillow, your mind a churning hellscape of bad memories and future anxieties, Hush has most certainly been by your side. They are a creature of the quiet they do not make a sound. Not ever. They can sense restlessness like a shark scenting blood in the water. And like a shark, they rush over to investigate. Unlike a shark, however, Hush will never bite check your vibe. They will simply lean over you a very little bit, concerned, and reach out a hand and very, very gently touch your head. All at once, these racing thoughts have stopped dead in their tracks. The music has ceased looping. The stress has receded. Hush has made your mind quiet and settled. The peace hits you immediately like a weighted blanket. Unfortunately, the side effect of this is that you are suddenly very prone to sleep paralysis. Hush does not know about sleep paralysis and they would certainly never try to make it worse. If your mind's eye opens and looks up, you may barely make out a face with empty eyes, and the mouth a tightly and very neatly sewn seam of black thread. Hush has been focusing on you, leaving you free under these odd and unlikely circumstances to perceive their face. It is possible at this point for a surge of fear to break their connection with you. Should you reawaken, Hush will be hidden away. They certainly didn't mean to scare you. Hush is a very gentle being. They are an excellent friend and pal to have within your house at night. The next time you feel sleep hit you like a sack of bricks after hours of tossing and turning, Take a moment as your consciousness fades to thank Hush for being so nice to you. I'm sure that they will appreciate it. Our very next cool dude is Hello. He thinks you're just adorable. And when you get up in the dark, he can't help but follow you around a little. He doesn't follow you into the bathroom. He has enough of a grasp on privacy to know not to do that. And at heart, he is a gentleman. As you mosey to and from your bed, picking your way carefully in the dark, he is just behind, leaning over you. He is very tall, you see, and drinking in all the charming noises you make when you are sleepy and bleary. He likes the way you move about. He thinks you're such a funny little guy. 
It's not very easy for him to move around, all folded up inside your house. He's putting in a special effort. Most of the time, he's sitting on your floor, stretched out a bit, reading your books, or trying to imagine what it's like for you to cook in your tiny kitchen. He'll go in every once in a while and check on you as you sleep. Your peaceful face is almost magnetic. Everybody looks so sweet and charming when they sleep. He never lingers to stare, though, because he doesn't want to cause you nightmares. The next time you're making your way back to your bed, and you sense something moving around in the dark, don't turn around. Hello is a lot to take in all at once, especially if you're not expecting him. And frightening you really would make him feel very bad. Hello has such a soft heart. Finally, we have our last and least familiar nighttime visitor. Who's there? She's more interested in your stuff than you. It's not that she's superficial. She's just extremely curious. She wants to know what all of your cupboards and boxes contain, and how all of your neat little gadgets work. She's very sensitive to texture. With her large hands and long, tapering fingers, she loves to explore the endless array available in your home. She feels differences that we will never notice. For example, she can stroke the keys on your keyboard and know which letters you like best. She's very grateful to you for letting her explore your home and the wonderful things inside of it. She's always very careful with the objects she handles and makes sure to put them back exactly as she found them. Accidents do happen, however, and this is why who's there will probably be the one to accidentally scare you the most. Every once in a while, something will slip out of her long fingers and fall over, or land on your floor. She stands very still while you rush out to investigate, wondering how you know it's her if you can't seem to see her. When you go back and fall asleep again, she's twice as careful as she was before. Because she's heard that sleep is very important to humans, and she feels bad for interrupting it. However, who's there has been known to cause accidents on purpose, but only when she thinks another human being is trying to get in. She knows that only the sleeping humans belong. So if another one comes creeping along ever so stealthily, she will, oops, knock something over that just happens to make a racket, and give you a better chance to make this new human go away. Often they leave of their own accord. Who's there really does want a good life for you. And although she can be a little clumsy at times and make you afraid, she really tries to make up for it by keeping you safe. Hush, Hello, and Who's There always travel together. Sometimes they get in one another's way, but they never fight. They are very companionable and even-tempered. Just the kind of visitors you might want in your house, I think. They've really enjoyed visiting you and learning about you. They really like you a lot. I hope you can rest easier and feel less lonely, knowing that these good friends are around watching over you, and wishing you the best. Huh, I never knew the darkness contained such creepy friends. If you liked that story, leave a like on the video to show your support. Subscribe now if you want weekly creepypasta and true scary stories. Enjoy the rest of the video. As it turns out, I never had an Uncle Sap. I still remember him, though. Sitting dour at certain family events. Drink always in hand. How's it going, Uncle Sal? I'd ask. Thinking he was just lonely and that talking to someone might cheer him up. I'm on the road to nowhere, Jack. He'd say. I never knew how to respond to that. Did I tell him that my name wasn't Jack? Or did I tell him that I was sorry his wife, my aunt, had died? 
but that tomorrow was another day. In fact, today was another day, and we were all here having fun and eating good food together, and so there was a reason to feel happy. Of course, it wouldn't have mattered, because he didn't exist. Always sitting there silently, sometimes deigning to validate the adequacy of the turkey dinner when pressed, and always telling me when I tried to cheer him up that he was on the road to nowhere. <laughs> you know, you are too, Jack, he'd say. The last that I, or anybody, saw of Uncle Sal was 22 years ago, on November 1st, early in the morning, before the sun was even up. I was in the kitchen, rooting through the drawers to find out where my parents had hidden the last of the Halloween candy. Out of the silence, there was suddenly much ado at the front door. A rattling of the knob, followed by a series of bangs, which spooked me for a moment, as I recalled images of monsters in the dark from the night before, until a familiar voice called out. Oh, for Christ's sakes! It's Sal! Let me in! A moment later, my dad came into view from upstairs, stark naked, looking as angry as I'd ever seen him. He walked over, pressed his hands against the door, and shouted at Uncle Sal to go home and sleep it off, or so help him. Open the fucking door! Said Uncle Sal in an even voice. I've got something important to say, and I don't know how much time I got left. Sleep it off, said Dad again. I was staring right at his hairy ass. It was gross, and I wondered if one day my own ass would grow as hairy. If only I could, said Sal, so quietly that I could barely hear him. Open the damn door, Don. I won't be but a minute. At last, my dad relented, undid the lock, and swung the door open, still naked, his manhood retreating into him as the cold fall air rushed into our sanctuary. This better be damn good, brother. Oh, uh, no, it's damn bad, said Sal, stepping inside and seeming somehow to darken our house. Then, to me, yeah, You know what? You might as well hear this too, Jack. I'm not Jack, I said in a small voice. Ain't your Uncle Sal, neither. That's what I came here to say. My father's anger, I noticed, had not abated. So you got a little high and had to share this great insight with us, huh? I'll tell you what, you're right. You're not a part of this family. Not anymore. This has been the last straw, barging in here like a maniac. You're nothing now. That's the exact truth, said Sal sadly. I heard a noise coming from my closet. It sounded awful like, like, like nails on a chalkboard, you know? It triggers a response inside of you. You can physically feel it sliding into your ears and entering your body, protruding your nerves and making you shiver. I found that I was suddenly shivering myself. What was it? I asked. It's nonsense, said my dad. And unless your former uncle vacates the property post haste, I'm calling the police to have him removed. When Sal made no move to leave, my father's hairy ass stalked off into the kitchen where the phone was located. You know, I didn't know what it was at first said Sal, now staring up the staircase, as if he expected something to come down it at any moment. But I was, I was too afraid to look. Didn't need anything from the closet anyway, just a bunch of old memories in there and dead suits I ain't had no use for over years. So I stayed right away. Spent lots of times at the bar, and when I was drunk enough, I'd stumble home and sleep on the couch. But I could still hear it. No, I could, I could still feel it. But it wasn't so bad when I was sloshed and down the hall from it. But did you find out what it was? I asked, both eager to know 
and afraid to know. I heard my father talking into the phone in the kitchen. You know what I did? Said Sal. Well, actually, it kind of sounds ridiculous now. But I suppose anything we do seems ridiculous from the right distance. Well, anyway, one night I was there on the couch, my head swimming in liquor, and my bank account dangerously dwindling, and I asked myself, what kind of man are you? Afraid of his own goddamn closet? I resolved then and there that I would stop the noise with my own bare hands. On the surface level, I had to convince myself it was all just some problem with the pipes behind the walls, but deep down I knew it wasn't that at all. I could feel it in my sails, my atoms. And after I had foolishly gathered some tools from the garage, that feeling grew stronger with each step I took towards my bedroom. With each decibel, that godforsaken noise increased. My dread did as well while facing it. My father returned to where we were standing by the door in front of the stairwell. Police are on their way, he said. I'm going to get dressed. No, 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 you know what? Stay a minute, Dawn. I'm just getting to the point. I was waiting for you. This is the last time you'll ever hear from me. So another minute won't hurt you. I could hear the bed on the floor above us creep, and my mother put her feet on the ground. She plodded off into the bathroom. You've got one minute, said my dad. If the police don't cut you out. Good, good. So there I was, tool bag in hand, doorknob in the other, ready to face whatever was in that closet. And I'm still shivering on account of that sound. That sound is just a warning of what I'm about to tell you if I can cobble the goddamn words together. Sal paused and reached into his coat pocket for a cigarette. You can't smoke in here said my dad. Arrest me then, said Sal, lighting up. Then he continued. I opened the door and I saw the source of this little sound. It was coming from this, this fucking crack. Not a crack in the wall, a crack in what I think of as reality. It was wide enough where I could see a little bit into it into what's lying behind what I now understand to be the paper-thin veneer of our reality. And it was crystalline. This intricate, incomprehensible pattern of glimmering blue multifaceted crystals. And then I leaned in to stick my head through that crack. Sal took a deep drag and blew the smoke out slowly. My father was as angry as ever. This is the most ridiculous nonsense I've ever heard. Even for you, Sal, this is a new pitch of insanity. I pity you, but the time has come to cut all ties. As I brought my head nearer and nearer, the noise increased in intensity. I was no longer shivering, but now violently convulsing. My body was doing its damnedest to warn me, but I had to know what this was all about. And so, with my ears bleeding, I stuck my head into the crack. At once, the terror stopped. So did the pain. Now, what I was looking into was reality as it actually is, controlled by these blue, cold crystals. Now, I didn't know if there was a consciousness in there, but it was making, I don't know, there was, there was something in there. Something making it all happen. Something experimenting. And whether, and whether the experiments were deliberate or not was unclear. But I felt a will. But it was, it was as if a will aimed at a specific person, or purpose, or not. I don't... I don't know. Your minute is up, said my dad. Just in time, because that's the end of the story. What I discovered is that I don't exist. Not really, never have. Thus concluding, Sal flicked his cigarette butt out the front door which was still standing wide open, despite the cold. <laughs> That's just about as good as the truth, said my father. You certainly never did anything with the life you were given. Take care, Don, said Sal. He turned to me. And you too, Jack. 
My name isn't Jack, I said, though I wanted to say so much more. I wanted to ask so many questions, but they wouldn't come to my lips. I could only insist that my name wasn't Jack, though a part of me wondered if it was. Sal turned around and walked out of her house, closing the door behind him, cutting off my view of the creeping red sunrise. It took some time and a great deal of trouble before I understood that my family was not merely pretending that Uncle Sal had never existed. To them, he hadn't. Nor did I find any physical evidence of his existence. Despite digging through long forgotten photographs in the attic, and even going so far as to bicycle the 30 miles to the house he had bought with my aunt, only to be told by the current owner that she had lived in there for the past 20 years, and didn't know anybody by the name of Sal. At first, I was desperate to convince people that Uncle Sal had, in fact, existed. But all I got from my efforts were looks ranging from annoyance to concern, and, more than once, the suggestion that maybe it was time to talk to somebody about all this. Somebody with a nice couch I could stretch out on, and who knew things about how my mind worked that I myself didn't know. And so, after a while, I decided that there was no point in trying to convince anyone of what I knew to be the truth. It has been easy enough through the years to forget about somebody who was universally agreed to have existed. And even easier, I found, to forget about somebody who nobody else remembered ever existing. At most, Uncle Sal would come to mind in a flash when I would, say, look over at the old chair in the corner of the dining room where I used to sit and glower during family events. Or sometimes I would catch some awful sound that made me shiver. A fork scraped against a ceramic plate, for example. And I would think of him and his crack in reality. I remember once asking my high school science teacher, whom I admired a great deal, why certain sounds, like nails on a chalkboard, affected us the way they did. No, that is an excellent question, said Mr. Hartley. I won't pretend to have the answer, but I can offer you a hypothesis. Most likely, there was a time in our evolutionary history when reacting with visceral revulsion to such sounds offered us a greater chance of survival. Say these noises sounded similar to the call of some ancient predator that stalked us in the night. Having an extra sensibility to these sorts of dangers would help alert us to dangerous presences that, meant, that were meant to harm us. You know, on the other hand, this theory is a little too neat. It is entirely possible that there is no good reason at all. That one day our ancestors randomly developed this trait, and since it didn't kill them, it stuck around, as, you know, you know other more useful traits would have worked towards our survival. So, nobody really knows? I asked. Mr. Hartley smiled. And you know, I'll confess that I'm not an expert on the subject. I'll tell you what though, Jim, if you want to research this topic and hand in a report on it, I'll give you extra credit. Not that you need it, at all. But I truly believe that learning something about the world we live in is its own reward. And frankly, I'm, I'm hoping that you take up the challenge so that I might learn something too. I accepted the assignment and researched the topic. At the time, the year 2000, the most authoritative study was done in 1986, when the scientists reproduced the sound with a forked garden tool on a chalkboard and then separated out the different frequencies contained in it. They found that it was the middle range of pitches that caused feelings of revulsion in the subject. They concluded, as Mr. Hartley had, that our response to these sounds was likely due to the offending pitches resembling the call of some predator early on in our evolution, such as possibly a certain type of monkey. Now armed with a perfectly rational explanation for why we were repulsed by these sounds, I forgot about Uncle Sal entirely, for several years. The world was a place that made sense, 
it wasn't some bizarre experimental illusion created by cold, alien things lurking behind a sheet of opaque paper. I was quite sure of that. Now we will skip ahead 20 years, through the building of a life that has been, on a whole, quite happy and fulfilling, to yesterday afternoon. I returned to my nice house on the outskirts of a small coastal town, where I had been teaching at a small, well-endowed university. My wife Alicia was in her studio, working on a painting. The children, I remember, were on a playdate with friends that would stretch into evening. Perfect opportunity, I thought, for lovemaking. Hey, sweetie, I said, sticking my head into the studio. You up for taking a little break? Maybe having a glass of wine with me? Alicia peeked around the canvas. She had red streaks of paint across her forehead, which turned me on. Sure. She said, smiling sweetly. Let me go wash up. No. I said. I like it better this way. My wife laughed, and we went down to the kitchen together to select a bottle of wine. Something white. She said. I've seen enough red for today. This piece I'm working on now, it may be the one that does me in. Sounds dramatic. I said, picking out a Pinot Grigio and holding up the bottle for approval. Alicia nodded. When do I get to see it, anyway? I asked, uncorking the bottle. I think it's formed enough now to look like something other than a swelling mass of placenta, so whenever you like. I poured out two glasses full and handed one to Alicia. Hey. She said. Before I forget, who's Uncle Sal? I froze, with the glass of wine inches from my lips. Who? Some guy claiming to be your uncle. Said he's been trying to reach you all day, so he tried my number. He had a message for you that I wrote down. How come you never told me you have an uncle? I became unstuck and swallowed down half the contents of my glass. I don't. I said, thinking about the series of unanswered calls I had received that day, from an unknown caller. Must have been a wrong number. Ah. Uh, said Alicia. He did say that the message was for a Jack, but, you know, some people use that as a nickname for James, so I thought that's all it was. The message was quite strange, too. I can't remember what it said for some reason, just that it was strange. It's up in the studio. I shivered. Might as well just toss it in the trash, since, you know, it's not for me. I never had an Uncle Sal, or even knew anybody by the name of Sal. Just a wrong number. Got it. Said Alicia. Shall we head upstairs and do the deed? I had grown cold inside, and wanted desperately to warm up. We should. I said, topping off my glass. Alicia led the way up the stairs, and I followed from behind, looking at the butt I knew so well, but which still was full of untold wonders for me. But the warm feelings didn't come, and instead... I was greeted by the sudden and hideous vision of my father's naked, hairy ass, as I had seen it all those years ago. I drained my glass mid-step, only successfully landing half of its contents in my mouth. The rest dribbled down my chin. We reached the second floor, and made way to the bedroom. But halfway there, Alicia stopped in front of her studio. Want to see it? She asked. The painting? Yes. I said. Think that by then, I could already hear the sound, feel it reaching into my ears and sliding into my body. Alicia led me into the studio and around to the front of the painting. There, on the canvas, was a chaotic bunch of dark colors smeared around and on top of each other. And on top of it all, in blood-red paint, 
some words. They read, You're on the road to nowhere. I dropped my wine glass to the floor as Alicia spoke above the increasing noise. That was the message, she said, from Uncle Sal. I turned to face her in uncomprehending terror as the noise increased in intensity. From mere fingernails scraping against a chalkboard to dark and heavy claws tearing through reality itself. Then a crack formed, and Alicia, my love, split down the middle, spilling out a cold blue and screaming the sound. I began jerking violently around, knocking over the canvas, and grew desperate to escape. I obeyed the most powerful, most primitive urge I had ever experienced, and ran out of the room and down the hall. I fell down the stairs, banging body parts against the treads and the balusters, but was too full of panic to feel any physical pain. I made it to the front door and outside into the purple twilight and kept running to where my car was parked. I jumped inside and started driving down the road. I drove for many miles, the pain now fully registering throughout my body, and finally pulled into a hotel parking lot. My intention was to drink myself into oblivion and pass out alone in a cheap room, pulling off the business of processing what had happened until there was some distance to look at it from. But after a few drinks, my nerves had steadied enough, and I was happy to convince myself that it had been just a strange hallucination. All of it, from Uncle Sal, the splitting apart of my wife, she was probably home now, I figured, alone with the kids, beginning to grow irritated that I wasn't there yet. The bartender lumbered over to refill my drink. He looked strangely familiar. I held up a finger and said, Give me a second. Not sure if I want another one yet. I pulled out my phone and went to call Alicia. But... I couldn't find her name in my contacts. I bit my lip and dialed her number manually. The line rang and rang. Well, said the bartender, what's it gonna be, Jack? I terminated the call, then pulled out my wallet and placed a $50 bill on the bar top. Keep the change, I said, standing up. And my name's not Jack. It never was. Don't you fucking forget it. Then, I walked out into the cold night. There's something in my room that cleans my apartment when I'm not there. By Weird Bryce Guy. The first time I came home to find my room cleaned, I thought my roommate had done it. That he had probably made some kind of mess while drunk with friends, and had tidied things up. Even going beyond the state of cleanliness I typically left it in. Nothing was missing or broken, so I hadn't said anything. Considering the matter resolved, when it happened a second time, things were a bit more unusual, because not only had the room been thoroughly cleaned, it had also been reorganized. My desk, which normally sits before the windowed wall, perpendicular to my bed, had been moved to the wall opposite to the one against which my bed was placed. Beneath the window was a plant that I hadn't ever seen before, soaking up the sunlight that poured into the room. The carpet had been freshly vacuumed, the wastebasket had been emptied, and my bed sheets had even been switched out. I immediately knew this could not have been the work of my roommate. Even if he weren't notoriously lazy in matters of hygiene and organization, he still couldn't have moved the desk on account of his presently broken arm, a consequence of his drunken adventures. 
The desk is massive, a gift from my father, who had used it for nearly a decade in his study back at home. It has many compartments in which he had stored his writing tools, small books, and other materials pertinent to his work. The key to these locked drawers had been lost when I moved into the apartment, so many of these objects still remain in the desk, inaccessible. With all that added weight, it would have been impossible for my roommate to move it, unless my roommate had violated the terms of the lease and made a copy of the key for his girlfriend. No one else had access to the apartment. And even if he had, his girlfriend hates me and wouldn't have done something so considerate. Even though logic argued against even the possibility, I asked him if he had cleaned my room, or if he at least knew anything about how it had been cleaned. I've caught him in lies before, having become quite adept at catching him in them, as my food often mysteriously disappears from the fridge. So I knew that he was telling the truth when he denied having any knowledge about the incidents. Ironically, he asked me quite sternly if I had given anyone an unsanctioned copy of the key. Since things hadn't yet escalated to being frightening, I decided not to do some paranormal activity style setup with cameras and sensors and all that. I also just couldn't reasonably afford such equipment. The idea of some cleanliness obsessed intruder seemed ridiculous and virtually impossible. Even though I couldn't think of a more plausible explanation, I figured that whatever the cause, the result was only to my benefit. I did decide to try and do better to keep the room clean, so that my unknown benefactor did not have to work so hard to maintain it. Assuming, of course, they were planning to continue. Things became truly unsettling the third time it happened. It was about a week after that previous incident. I had gone to bed late, having been busy with some work I had taken home. I still awoke at my usual time, needing to present the very same work to my supervisors first thing in the morning. I hadn't had time to tidy up the night before, nor in the morning. I'd barely managed to get myself in order before heading out. When I arrived home later that day, the room was clean. Immaculately clean. I've never been in the military, but I imagine that the level of order, alignment, and neatness present within that room would have made a drill sergeant proud. It would have put the best housekeeping services of the most luxurious hotels to shame. It was model-like. I felt unclean in comparison, unworthy of entrance, standing at the threshold of that pristine space. Someone, something else, must have felt similarly because as I took a tentative step into the room, I was suddenly, violently hurled back into the hallway. As I landed, dust was brushed from the shelf by some invisible force, floating away into nothingness. Apparently, there had been one last task to be performed before I was to be allowed entry. I quickly scrambled to my feet, more alarmed than physically shaken. I expected, subconsciously hoped, to see my roommate's grinning face peek around the corner. But no face appeared, and regardless, I'd had a clear view into the room, and would have seen even the slightest instant of corporeal movement. There was nothing visible that could have propelled me backwards. I hadn't tripped or stumbled, hadn't the momentum for any sort of faltering to have occurred. Patently afraid, I betrayed my logical mind and called out into the room. H hello seemed to echo through some gray space, as if the walls had receded to greater dimensions on some other plane, leaving only after images of their original placements. When no one answered, I decided to again try entering the room. I remember then that my roommate wasn't even home, that I was alone, 
with the apparently immaterial presence. I didn't want to leave the room, in case the seemingly malevolent entity decided to wreak havoc elsewhere. It wasn't courage that led me to step inside and close the door, but neither was it stupidity. I just wanted, if possible, to ensure that it did not get out. The furniture hadn't been moved again, but some of my posters and personal items had been removed. Pretty much anything that had shown or represented what you might call distasteful or controversial imagery was absent or tucked behind more appropriate items. Posters showcasing death metal members or their album covers, video game figurines of monstrous creatures, books whose spines displayed titles pertaining to the horrific, macabre, and occult, all removed or hidden. Who or whatever had cleaned the room had taken special care to eradicate or obfuscate anything that might have made a nun or an old lady scowl. The air, which I had somewhat anticipated to be heavy with some spectral residue, was surprisingly light and breathable, as if the atmosphere too had been sanitized. It was paradoxically both calming and terrifying. Physically refreshing, but psychologically unsettling. The force or entity had already shown itself to be capable of physical violence. And while it hadn't acted again, the possibility that I was powerless to defend myself did not by even the slightest measure assuage my fright. I was knocked out of my terror-induced contemplations by the collision of a small object against my forehead. It hadn't hurt, much, so I wasn't immediately sent cowering to a corner. I looked and found the item, and picked it up. It was a key, a very old one, with an inscription on its face that had faded to illegibility long ago. The only thing in the room to which it might have belonged to was my father's old desk. Cautiously, feeling the gaze of some unseen observer upon me, I walked to the desk and inserted the key into the topmost drawer. As I had suspected, it was a perfect fit. There were old pens and large books with time yellowed pages within the drawer. Unlocking several more drawers, I found items of similar use in antiquity. I left these where I had found them, not wanting to get a single speck of dust anywhere on the freshly polished surface of the desk. All that remained to be unlocked was the right-sized lowest drawer, the largest of them all. I unlocked and opened the compartment, and found something wholly unlike the others inside. It was a vase, darkly colored as if sculpted in obsidian, but made of porcelain. It was capped by a small knob, also porcelain, with remnants of some sort of wax sealant ringed at intervals around its rim. There were no markings or embellishments that could be seen on the body of the vessel, but the structure and craftsmanship nonetheless suggested it was of high value. Financially, or culturally. I placed it on the desk, handling it with delicate care that I hadn't consciously thought to employ. It had what can best be described as a funeral air, and I guessed at the contents, feeling them gently toss about within the vase. In that moment I had forgotten, or perhaps was made to forget, the shocking supernatural happenings of only moments before. A morbid curiosity had taken hold of my mind, and urged by a powerful, though unknown impetus, I picked away the sealant and removed the cap. As if it had been pressed inside the cap, something within surged upwards, propelling me back. The source of the eruption was invisible, but the pressure was undeniably tangible. I was knocked to the floor by a force even greater than the one that had pushed me into the hall. I feebly climbed onto my bed. The wind knocked out of me. The vase, despite the sudden interruption, hadn't moved from its place on the desk. Whatever had poured forth from within had done so without 
even making the thing wobble. I sat there, both amazed and horrified, as the imperceptible force then became partially visible. A wavering, translucent form in the shape of a person. Though it stood over me, it was apparently rather short, and I knew that if I stood, I'd be at least a foot taller. But I was totally subdued by fear, and it might as well have been the phantom of some titan standing over me. Finally, dear lord, now you listen here. I didn't spend the better part of my youth teaching my son how to take care of himself, only for him to squander that knowledge and allow his son to live like this. I know you're an adult, and you can do what you want, but that doesn't mean you should live in squalor. Your father managed to learn eventually. I expect you to as well. I never want to see this room in this state it was ever again. Do you understand me? I nodded utterly perplexed by the specter's heated lecture, unsure of how else to respond. Good. I don't want to see any of that, that filth around here. How do you expect the nice young woman over with all those satanic images and horrible plastic men around? I won't have my grandson becoming some kind of punk. Now, give Grandma a kiss. And then the familiarity of that voice hit me. Even with the slightly ghostly intonation, the voice was plainly that of my grandmother's, and her unique outline was vaguely apparent in the apparition as well. Still, fear hadn't yet left me, because my grandmother was dead, and up until that point, I hadn't believed in life after death at all. But it was undeniable. My grandmother, some spiritual manifestation of her had just chastised me on my sloppiness. Well? I perceived the image had drawn closer and remembered that she had demanded a kiss. I fought through the terror that stiffened my body and leaned forward with lips pursed. A moment later, something smooth yet cold, like a cheek that had been without the warmth of life for quite some time touched my lips. I withdrew a moment later, the action completed, and stared fearfully at the ghostly figure, who seemed satisfied. Now, if it wouldn't inconvenience you, would you mind driving Grammy to your father's house? It's obvious that in his uncourageable forgetfulness, he failed to perform the one thing I asked him to do, once I met my end. I told him to scatter my ashes throughout my garden where I've buried so many of my furry children over the years, and where I've planted so many beautiful things. Take me to him, so I can remind him of the promise he made his frail and dying mother all those weeks ago. There was an almost imperceptible snicker that followed the latter part of her speech. I obviously had so many questions regarding the afterlife and her, obviously stubborn, spiritual persistence. But she dismissed them all, and demanded that I take her to my dad without delay. Unable to argue, I picked up the vase, and she returned therein just as violently as she had left it. And just as I had driven her to the pharmacy or the grocery store during our life, I drove her vase-bound spirit to my dad's house. Along the way, she criticized my driving, saying that I drove like a rock star tour bus driver. We arrived, and she quieted up as I strode across the front lawn. I knocked, and my dad answered a few moments later. I immediately put the vase into his arms and said that I had found it in the desk. His surprise at my sudden visit quickly turned to shock at seeing the vase. And then, that gave way to deep remorse upon remembering what he had vowed to do. I patted him on the shoulder and quickly turned away almost jogging to my car. I took one last glance before pulling out of the driveway, smiling to myself as my father tentatively removed the cap from the vase. My little brother got stuck in an air vent by God damn it, Will. 
As children, me and my little brother would always race each other through the air vents in our house to see who could get to the room faster. Dad would always tell us not to do it since one of us could get stuck. But we never believed him, so we just did it when he wasn't around. He was probably just tired of us always popping out of the air vent and scaring him. I would win pretty much every time at first, but eventually I started having troubles moving in the tight spaces due to my growing body, which my brother would only get better and better until our roles had reversed and suddenly he was the one always beating me. It wasn't that I was getting slower, quite the opposite in fact. Something inside me said that if I moved too fast through the vents, I would eventually get stuck. So I stopped racing. This ticked my little brother off. You're just mad because you're losing, he would shout. I ignored him and went up to my room. After about a half an hour, my dad called and said that he was going to be late and to unload the dishwasher and to get my little brother to help rake the leaves outside. It was uh, pretty normal for my dad to be late, so I did as I was told without question. It was only when I went to rake the leaves that I noticed something was wrong. 45 minutes had passed since I came home from school with my little brother, and yet I hadn't seen him since getting here. That wasn't normal. He was always bugging me to play with him or do something stupid that would get us in trouble and I would always turn him down. Had he finally given up? No, that didn't seem like him. I assumed that something had happened at school that upset him, unless he was still mad at me about the vent thing, but that wouldn't make any sense. If it was me, he probably just tried to punch me or something like that. It must have been something I don't know about. I got up to his room, but he wasn't there. I searched the whole house, but I didn't find him anywhere. If he had left, I probably would have heard the front door opening. I searched again, this time looking through each and every nook and cranny that he could hide in, all while calling his name. I was about to give up and say he ran out when I wasn't paying attention and call the police. That's when I heard him crying. Donnie, where are you? No response. Okay, come on out. Donnie, this isn't funny anymore. I, I can't, he said between heavy sobs. It felt like I was talking to a ghost. Where the hell was he? And that's when it clicked for me. There was only one place I hadn't checked yet. The air vents. Donnie, are you stuck in the air vent? Though he whispers, I manage to make out a... <laughs> uh-huh. Suddenly my mind was racing. My first thought was to call the police, but then it hit me. Dad doesn't know about air vent racing. If he found out, he would never let it go. Heck, he probably wouldn't let us do anything by ourselves ever again. Let left... Only one option. Hang in there, Donnie. I'm coming to get you. <laughs> okay. It was crazy, but what choice did I have? Grabbing a flashlight from my dad's toolbox, I forced my way into the basement's air vent. It was a tight squeeze. I had to ram my body against the sides of the vent in order to stretch it open enough for me to move easily. With the flashlight in my mouth, I started crawling through the vent like a mole trying my hardest to follow my little brother's cries. They were reverberating off the walls so much it was impossible to tell where they were coming from. Eventually, I found that I had looped back around the same place I started. This was getting nowhere. If my brother was trapped anywhere, it had to be a narrow part of the vents in the center of the house, near the boiler. I went there and shone my flashlight through, but saw nothing. Damn, where was he? I only had a little bit of time before dad came home, and then I would have to explain the whole thing to him. I tried to call out again. Donnie, where are you? I, I don't know. Great, thanks for the help, Donnie. 
What room are you close to? I can't tell, he said. Donnie, listen to the sound of my voice. What direction is it coming from? I, I can't tell, he said. Right, the reverberation. What about before? Right before I came in here. Was I close or far away? Um, you were close, I think. Uh, really close. So, he was near the basement? But that doesn't make any sense. I already checked all the vents near the basement. He must be in the upstairs shaft. I'm really sorry, big brother. He cried. I could hear his voice echoing from all around me. It was like he was talking to me from every direction. I wanted to crawl through the basement vent to your room so I could jump out and, sc and scare you. But then I got stuck. I, I just wanted to show you th that I could crawl through the air vents with no problems. I'm so sorry. His wails got louder. It was so... Super annoying. Listen, Donnie, I'm going to get you out of here, so stop crying, okay? He must have listened because he calmed down a little after that. But at least he had given me an important clue, his destination. I retreated my steps through the vent back to the basement, following the dents I had made in the sides. Then I proceeded to crawl through the basement vent shafts towards my bedroom. Doing this brought back a lot of memories for me. But at the same time, I remembered why I had stopped. By the time I was on the other side, I was covered in bruises and cuts. And most importantly, I hadn't seen any sign of my little brother. It didn't make any sense. He knew the layout of the vent shafts better than I did. There was no way he had gotten lost. I called down to him again. Donnie, what route were you using to get to my room? The shortest route, he said. That was the route I took. I couldn't have possibly missed him. The two of us couldn't even fit in any of the vent shafts together anyways. Was it possible that he knew a shorter route than I did? It seemed hard to believe, but there didn't appear to be very many other possibilities. Begrudgingly, I went back through the vent shafts, this time exploring every path that forked off from the one I believed to be the shortest. When I found myself back in the basement, I turned around and looked again. This repeated multiple times, to the point where I even drew a map to make sure I didn't miss anything. He just wasn't anywhere. Of course, I hadn't considered the possibility he might not actually be stuck. Instead, he was just lying to make me crawl through the vents a bunch of times as a punishment for not racing him today. He could see my flashlight beam to know where to get out of the way in time, and, and since we had no other way of locating each other, he would be able to avoid me with ease. It was a far-fetched theory, but at this point, it was the only thing that made sense. Hey, Donnie, stop being cruel. Just get out of there already. What, what do you mean? I, I can't move. His crying started up again, this time louder than ever. It didn't sound like he was lying. Eventually, Dad came home and I explained everything that had happened. He wasn't nearly as angry as I expected, and he seemed to agree that my theory was the only possible explanation for everything. He went into his toolbox and grabbed a handsaw, then looked at me with a wink. If he won't come out willingly... We'll just have to cut the vent open until he has nowhere left to hide. I wasn't sure if property damage would be worth a little bit of revenge, but at the same time, my little brother could have left at any time he wanted. So at the end of the day, he was the one to blame for the damage that was about to be caused. He went down to the basement again, this time following the underside of the vent shaft in the first cross section. My dad placed the handsaw on the corner of the vent and started cutting. As soon as he made the first cut, everything went wrong. My little brother started to squeal in pain, his voice echoing through the entire house, blood pouring down the saw onto my dad's arm. 
He looked at me in horror and started shouting, Quick, call the ambulance now! I rushed to the phone, but even as I dialed the emergency number, I couldn't believe that I had searched so long for my little brother in those air vents and came up empty, while my dad was able to find him on his first try. The irony was too morbid to stomach. When I returned, I saw that my dad had tried to make another cut in the vent to try to reach in and pull him out, only to be met with more blood and more screaming. The two cuts were far enough apart from each other that they couldn't possibly both come from my little brother, unless he was moving. Stop it! It hurts! He cried. My dad's solution to this was to simply start the vent grate and keep cutting until he encountered more blood. But even by making the small cut in the entrance, he was met by blood and screams. It defied all common sense. His explanation was the blood was coming from somewhere inside the grate and that cutting it was causing the grate to rattle, which was aggravating a wound my little brother had inquired at some point earlier. But I knew, at that moment, I could have sworn the grate entrance looked like a face. Once the ambulance arrived, I was sent back up to a room. Not that it mattered, I could still hear everything from the vent in my room. No matter what room in the house I was in, I couldn't escape his cries. <laughs> I'm so thirsty! <laughs> That's when it dawned on me. There was one thing I still hadn't tried yet. I ran down into the kitchen and filled a big salad bowl with water, and then I carried it up to my room, being extra careful not to spill anything. I then poured the water down into the vent shaft. Hey, Donnie, which way is the water coming from? I listened closely for an answer, but received none. All I could hear were the sounds of someone drinking. Later that night, my grandparents came and picked me up, and I started living at their house. After a couple of days, my dad started living there, too. Our old house was quarantined off by the government for a long time until it was eventually demolished and another house was built on top of it. Some old neighbors said that they took something away in a big semi-truck before demolishing the building, and there was a bunch of rumors at school about what had happened. As a teenager, I started having nightmares about my brother being stuck in the air vents in my body, such as my respiratory system, digestive tract, or ear canal. It got to me so much, I started trying to destroy the air vents to make him go away. My dad and grandparents stopped me, and I told them about the nightmares, and they sent me to counseling, which I took until my late 30s, when I was finally able to recover. I tried so hard to forget about the past events, but there was one thing that still bothered me. I couldn't work up the courage to ask my dad until he was already on the last legs, but the answer was the one I knew from the beginning. Dad? Why didn't we ever have a funeral for Donnie? He looked at me and smiled weakly. Donnie never died. I knew that already. I could still hear his cries. A huge thank you to my first ever patrons for helping support the channel. 242 Reads, and Miss Creepy Tales. If you want your name on here and to support the channel, links to my Patreon below. Of course, I also want to thank my collaborators for helping me bring the spooks and making the stories that much better. Vexorus, Dr. Anastasia from The Scare Lab, M. Frightmare, and 242 Reads. Links to all their channels are down in the description, and I highly recommend you check out every single one of them because they are amazing creators. Thank you all for listening, and I'll see you next time with another story.